Good morning. I'm Matt. I'm the campus pastor in Pecola. I'm glad to be here today. I'm really kind of excited. Christmas is probably one of my favorite times of year. Um, I thought about this as I was preparing this sermon, just kind of what, what this whole season is about. And I think you kind of sum it up in anticipation. And you think about anticipation, anticipation, if you look at a definition, it is this. And I went to basically the place everyone goes for information, Wikipedia. And anticipation is an emotion involving pleasure or anxiety in considering a, or awaiting an expected event. And so you think about anticipation like that is pretty much summed up with everyone that has a kid in this room right now. Like you're in the final stretch. Those kids are about to lose their minds. School is over. I mean, they're, they're out for a little bit. And I mean, they're just, they're trying to figure out what's under the tree, right? They're trying to figure out what's they're going to get when Christmas Day comes. And I can remember as a kid, I, I've talked many a times about my brother Chuck, uh, how he probably gave me the best gifts I ever got. And I've talked about one time he gave me a bicycle, and, and, and that was an amazing gift. I mean, granted, it was, it was awesome. But at the end of the day, it was not even close to the coolest thing he ever got me as a kid. I remember I was, I think I was seven, maybe eight years old, and uh, I was ate up with a little movie you may have heard of. It's called The Empire Strikes Back. Now, now you can, you can say it's not the best movie in the Star Wars franchise, but you'd be absolutely wrong. I did not pay Randall for this. Um, but I was ate up with it. My brother, I was, I was young at the time when it came out. I was only six. But I was awesome to have an older brother, 12 years older than me, and so he took me to see all of them in the theater. And I just remember just being, this is just the most awesome thing I'd ever seen. I just, I, I had these little action figures, and no, they were not dolls. Don't call them that. And I would play with them, and I would, I would fight against the evil empire that was going to destroy the whole world. And, you know, you had, you had Luke and Han Solo and Chewbacca and all these awesome figures, and I, I would play out these battles and I can remember thinking I'd just love to have like an X-wing fighter where I could just totally decimate the empire or even have an, a, a TIE fighter where I could just annihilate the good guys even. But to be perfectly honest, my family didn't have a whole lot of money and the, the, the action figures I got that were two or three bucks, that was pretty much all they could afford. And I remember this Christmas in particular because Chuck was like, hey, you're going to love your present this year. I have looked hard and long. I have searched far, and, and I've found this thing. And remember, this is, this is the early 80s. There was no internet. Like, when he said he had searched, he literally went to store to store to store to find stuff. And so I remember Christmas come, and it's Christmas Eve, and, and of course, you have to go to bed early on Christmas Eve. And I remember... That year, I was particularly thirsty that night, so I got up about 12 or 13 times to try to figure out what was going on, obviously, in the living room. And I remember my mother finally just said, go back to bed, or there really is no Christmas tomorrow. And so I went to bed, scared to death. You know, maybe I've just pushed it a little too far. But I remember waking up the next morning. Of course, it was about 4.30 in the morning when I woke up, but that still constitutes morning. And I think I finally got my parents, my brother, and everybody out of bed about six or seven. And I remember I walked into the living room, and the most amazing thing I'd ever seen in my childhood life was there. See, I'd spent probably the entire last month and a half looking through the Sears catalog. Anybody remember that? You got the Christmas catalog, right? For you kids in here, that's actually a book they mailed to you that's kind of like the internet, but it had pages. And I remember there was always a toy section at Christmas. And I mean, I had searched through that thing in my grandma's house because my grandma always got one. And literally by Christmas Eve, like the pages are pulling out of the toy section. I'd like thumb through them so many times and looking at all the different stuff I could have. And with everything I had looked at, I could not have anticipated what was waiting me as I walked into that room. As I walked into that room, the very ship that flew the Kessel Run at less than 12 parsecs was setting on the table. And if you don't know what that is, you need to learn, all right? Okay, that's Millennium Falcon. And thank you, Ron Howard, for correcting the whole parsec thing and giving us a, a way out of that big plot hole. But it was there, like this, this ship was there, and it was amazing. I was this kid, and I was just overjoyed. And the anticipation I had building up to that point 
totally paid off. Because my brother was right. He did not short sell me on that one. That, it was an amazing gift. And I remember as a kid just playing with it. And, and what I didn't know is every time I walked into the room, they were putting the seven billion stickers that come with the thing on the ship. And every time they'd have to put it away and they'd lose track of stuff. And so they weren't real happy with me of that. But I thought about anticipation. And maybe, I mean, maybe you didn't get the Millennium Falcon. Maybe you didn't have a cool brother. But you've anticipated something in your life. Now, it may be graduation. Maybe you've worked very, very hard to have a certain grade point average, and as you push towards graduation, whether it be from high school or college, that when that day came and you walked across and you got that diploma, it was just this amazing feeling that you'd pushed towards your entire life. Maybe it's when you get out of school and you get that first job that's like the job you've always wanted. You know, you, you've dreamed of it, and now you're there, and you can't even believe you're there. And the, the anticipation and that buildup towards it, it just totally paid off. Maybe it's a house. Maybe you remember the first time you bought a house, and that first time the realtor gave you those keys, and you realize, man, this, this literally is mine. Like, I own this. Maybe you're like me and you stood at the front of a church like this and some doors opened in the back and the most beautiful woman you ever saw in your life came walking down an aisle and for all of your life you anticipated seeing that woman. If you're a woman, you could be in the back and you could look forward and I'm not going to leave you out. But there was this payoff from the anticipation. And what I would say today is there's an anticipation or there should be an anticipation with us that had a payoff in the season that we're living in. That as you look at the Bible and you look at the Old Testament, that from the moment the sin entered this world and there was a fall in Genesis 3, there was this anticipation of someone who was going to come and save us. There was an anticipation that there, there would be a Messiah that would redeem us from our sins and that we would look forward to him. If you look at what the Old or the New Testament says about the Old Testament, that they were looking towards that Messiah to save them, and it was their faith in that Messiah that would save them. And so what I want to do today, I want to look through a few scripture, starting in Isaiah, and I want to look at these people as they anticipated this Messiah they said would come. So if you would turn with me in your Bible, it says Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. And we're going to begin here because I think it's a, kind of the first clear kind of image of, of what the prophets were saying as they looked towards the Messiah. The first image of this sign that would come that would identify the one who would be our Savior. So Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, it reads like this. It says, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, Haley just read the version of this from Matthew in Matthew 1 and 23. And, and what Matthew adds is he says that not only will his name be Emmanuel, but that name will mean God with us. That it will be God among us. God come to be here for us. And so Isaiah, you look, he, he wrote this 700 years before the coming of Christ probably. And he wrote it in such a way that it was kind of twofold prophetic. That as he speaks it to this man, to this king, it has a prophecy that's going to become true right then and there. But God was using it as an early representation, an early kind of image of what's going to happen, what's going to be a sign to come in the future. And so you read that, you look at that, and you know instantly that Isaiah is already, he's looking towards the future. He's looking towards this Messiah who would come. He has anticipation that a Messiah will come. But see, Isaiah died well before he ever came to this world. See, you look back a little bit, and you, maybe two weeks ago we had Jason Thomas here, and he's talking about John the Baptist. So John the Baptist, he's the last of the Old Testament prophets. He's the last guy who was born who would prophesy before the coming of Christ. And we look at Malachi chapter 4, verses 5, and it actually speaks of this one who's going to come. It says, Elijah will come again. He'll proclaim the gospel, basically the good news. He'll proclaim that this Messiah is going to be there, that God's going to be among us. 
And so you see, 400 years before the coming of Christ, before silence happened for 400 years, Malachi, the last thing he says is that there will become one who heralds the new king. 400 years before the coming of Christ, there was anticipation of him. See, it didn't end with Isaiah. It continued on through the prophets. And see, when John came, as, as Jason talked about, he came out and he proclaimed this gospel, this, this, this thing that would come, that there, there needed to be the kingdom of God was at hand, and we need to believe it, and we need to understand it, and then we repent of our sins because of it. See, John, he, he anticipated this Messiah. And see, John was lucky. He got to see part of it, right? John got to see the Messiah as an adult. He got to see one of his relatives come into this world as the Messiah, who is the Savior. But he didn't get to see him fall it all the way through. See, he died before Christ went to the cross. And so he, he saw part of it, but he had this belief, just like the Old Testament prophets, like all the people in Israel in the Old Testament had believed in something that was going to come, even though they never saw it happen. And so I would say we're in good company when we have anticipation towards who Messiah is and what he's going to do. And I, I would be remiss if, if I left you there and didn't read a, a chapter of the Bible that honestly I've heard every Christmas Eve for the last 24 years as my father-in-law will read this to us, as Ray will read it to us before we do anything else, and he will set the tone of what this season's truly about. That it's about this child that came. And so, so if you will follow with me, chapter 2 of Luke, verse 1. It's nothing new. It's nothing you haven't heard before. But it's something that I think we need to be reminded of. And in verse 1, he begins to say this. He says, in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. And it says there in verse 3, it says, And all went to be registered, each to his, each to his own town. So there's a census that was called in Israel that, that everyone would have to go back basically to their home city, the city of their family, their tribe, and they'd have to be registered so they'd know how many people were there so the taxes could be done correctly. And so Joseph, he, he takes his wife, he, he gets married, and he begins this long journey there. Verse 4, it says this, it says, And Joseph also went to, from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judah. Uh, and it goes on, it says, uh, To the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house of lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. So we have Mary, we have Joseph, they're, they're heading toward Bethlehem, they're betrothed, and to understand that, we need to know what that even means it means that they were legally bound together, that, that basically a woman, when she reached a certain age, typically her early teens would be betrothed to a man. Basically, think about engagement, but, but on steroids. That once they're betrothed, they're legally bound. That, that even though they're not together intimately, they're linked together through this betrothal. And so they would not have known each other in, the, in, in that sense, but they would have been to the point where a divorce would be required for them to separate. If you look back at Matthew and what Haley read that I never really thought about until I was really doing some research on this, Mary knew about this kind of really before it happened, right? The, the angel Gabriel came to her and said, you're going to have a child that the Holy Spirit will come upon you and a child will be conceived in your, in your belly, basically, and that you're found favor among, amongst, uh, uh, before God because of this. But see, Joseph didn't get the warning. Joseph was told this after the fact, after Mary became pregnant. And so there's got to be this anticipation among the both of them that, that even though angels from heaven literally came to them and told them that this baby's going to be born, there had to be some anxiety, there had to be some feelings going on about what in the world's about to happen. And now they're headed to Bethlehem, they're going to this place to... Uh, be counted for the census and and you got to think there's some confusion some anxiety like I say some anticipation about what's about to happen the Bible goes on and reads like this and says while they were there the time came for her birth and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn 
So the time came, the most anticipated time in history came. And if you were to write a movie, if you write a book, you would not have put this in there. Like you would not have the king of the world, the the king of all the universe, the the, the Messiah who would come and, and basically wipe out the sins of those who would believe in him. You would not have had him born in a barn or a cave or whatever structure there was where they kept these animals. You wouldn't have had him born there. A man of royalty, someone who came down from heaven. That's not where you picked for him to be. But see, God decided that, that his son would enter this world humbly. He would enter this world humbly so that we could understand that he will know our sorrows. He will know our pain. He will know our temptations. See, he entered this world in, in kind of an insignificant way, even though it was the most anticipated moment in all of the Bible. Even though he was the most significant birth in all, all, all time. He entered in such an insignificant way. See, it goes on, and, and if you were to say, oh man, this moment has come finally. Isaiah prophesied, of Malachi prophesied, all these Old Testament prophets said all these things about this moment as it would come. Where would you have thought that God would send his angels to proclaim it? Well, here's where God chose to go. It says that in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy. That will be for all people, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, and lying in a manger. And suddenly there, were, there was the, with the angels a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. So you got Jesus, you got Jesus born in a manger, born in a barn. Most anticipated moment in history. And who does he proclaim it to but a bunch of shepherds? Now, if you've been in church very long, you know, the Bible alludes to God being like a shepherd a lot of times. It alludes to Christ. He would say himself he was, a, he was a good shepherd. But if you look at historically, shepherds were not thought well of. Shepherds were considered to be shifty. They were considered to be guys who, who were kind of transient. They would wander around the countryside with these sheep, and a lot of times they would steal. A lot of times they would lie. A lot of times they weren't just kind of flat-out criminals. To the point that if you were a shepherd and you witnessed something, you couldn't testify in court because they wouldn't trust any of them. And so you had the greatest moment of all time proclaimed to a bunch of people that if you were to write it in their time if, as it was, no one would have trusted the shepherds. See, Luke, he went around, he, he took testimony from people, and he most likely either talked to the shepherds or talked to people that knew them And if he included this, he knew it was going to be kind of suspect because people already didn't trust shepherds. But God chose to trust shepherds. See, one of the things I I read as I was going through this, that if if this happened in the time of year we believe it does, you know, if Christ was actually born in in the December-type months or in this time, most likely the sheep that they were raising were those that would be going for Passover. But these shepherds were actually raising the sheep that would go into the temple and be basically slaughtered for the sins of Israel. Men who were considered unclean. Men who couldn't have went to the temple themselves. They were raising these sheep. And see, I think God understood who they were. And that's why he proclaimed it to them. He did it so that we can understand that we are just like them. We don't have a lineage, maybe. We don't have this great story to tell. We may have fallen horribly to sins in our lives. But yet Christ, when he comes, God would want to proclaim it to us as well. See, I I do read all this, and I've done all this, and said all this. And the one question that really came to mind is, why is this even important? Why did this birth matter? 
I mean, I know it's God. I know God sent his son and he sent him into the world. But, but if we just leave it at the birth and we just did nothing else, it, it really would have had very little significance for our lives. So as I thought through it, I, I went back and like I said, what I say in Luke 2 is nothing new. And what I'm about to tell you is really nothing new either. And most of you can probably quote this verse. It's John 3.16. See, the reason the birth is significant because the birth made John 3.16 possible. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Think about that for a moment. God sent his son. He, he used all of the Old Testament to prophesy, to push towards this moment in time, most anticipated moment in history. He pushed towards it, not because the birth would be significant, but because the sacrifice would be. That he sent his son to die for you in your place for your sin. Die in such a way that, that he was sinless. He had lived his life. He had went through temptation. The devil himself came down, tempted him many times, and yet he never fell. He would go to a cross. He would die for you, not because you were good enough, not because you were anything, but just because you were like Mary, someone who was just shown grace and found mercy. See, he came in this world to die for us. There's a song by Ryan K. It says, I celebrate the day you were born to die. And see, that's what we do today. We celebrate the fact that God sent his son into this world so he could die in our place for our sins. And see, I, I, I would say today, everyone in this room is in one of two places. See, I think there's some of you that are in this room that you need to see that God's here waiting for you to run to him. See, you may have anticipated it. You may be trying to clean yourself up, right? That's what we do, right? When I get clean enough, when I fix my own junk in my life, then I'll go to church again. But until then... I don't think God wants to see me. And see, I would say it's just like Jason talked last week, that God is like the prodigal's daddy waiting for us to come running to him, stinking of pig and slop, unkept. He's waiting for us to run to him so that he can throw the best clothes on us, put a ring on our finger, and show the world that we are his. See, I think there's some in the church today that you're that person. And I would say quit anticipating God and start running to him. He's here. He has come. He has sent his son to die specifically in your place. And I would say today's the day to understand that and accept that. And see, some of you are here today and, and you're, you're not new to the faith. You've actually been in the faith a long time. Maybe you've been walking around and maybe you just stopped anticipating anything. Maybe you stopped anticipating anything. See, I can remember at one point in time I had these huge dreams for God. Huge dreams. Dreams that only God could accomplish. And I'll be honest, he's accomplished some of them. Some of them have been things I never dreamed would happen. But some of them, and be honest you today, I've fallen away. Some of those things I've kind of given up on. I got some sticky notes on my desk, and one of them is that we would own the Napa store in Pecola. That we as a church would own it. And I'll be honest with you, right now, the price on that thing is so far out that there's no way we could spend that much money on it. But see, what I forgot is that God, he's still God. And see, over this last week, God has been convicting me of the fact that I've quit dreaming. That I've quit thinking big, even though there's evidence that God would do things. See, see, when Isaiah spoke to that king, what he had said before the prophecy was, tell me what sign you want to see that I'm God. Tell me what sign you want to see. And the king looked at him and, or looked at the prophet and just said, I would not test God like that, which is basically a religious way of saying, I don't trust that God would do it. And see, I'll be honest, 
over this last year through the midst of all this mess that has happened to us as a world, there have been times when I've lost my dreams and my anticipation that God is going to do amazing things. You see, as I studied out this scripture, I began to see God has not changed. I did. And for me, it's the time when I need to realize I'm like the prodigal's older brother. And I don't realize that everything God has is already mine. And see, I think some of you are in here today and you need to realize that. That if you're a Christian, and if you believe in Christ, that if you've come to that saving understanding in your mind, confessed it with your mouth, everything God has is yours. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to be rolling big and money and everything else, but it means that God's looking out for you. That you may have to suffer like Job did, but you know what? Job was never left by God. You may prosper, and that has nothing to do with you. It has to do with God who showed you favor and allowed you to do that. But, but see, what we need to never do is believe that we're just out here by ourselves. Most anticipated moment in history. We get to celebrate it this week. And the way I think we celebrate it is that we don't walk out of these doors the same way we walked in. But as we walk out, we either do it with a new sense of understanding who Christ is to us as our Savior, as the Messiah that was prophesied to come, or we do it with a new found anticipation that God is going to do amazing things through us, through our church, and through those that we disciple and reach out to. Don't leave here the same way you walked in. If you'll pray with me. Father God, I just come before you today, and I thank you, God, for your grace. I thank you, God, that you sent your son to die in our place. I thank you, God, that you don't show me grace because I have merit to deserve it, God. You simply show it because you decide to pour it out upon me. God, I pray for each and every person in this room. God, if, if there are those here today that don't know you, that have never understood who you are, I pray, Father, that your spirit even right now would be heavy upon them, that the conviction of God would be so unbearable, God, that they can do nothing more than cry out to you. And I pray, Father, if there are those here today, God, that simply have given up dreaming big and believing that you will do mighty things. I would pray, Father, that, God, you would renew in them, allow them to see who you are completely and totally. God, I thank you for your son who came to die, to die in our place. Lord, I ask this all in Christ Jesus' name.